Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's forum. My name is Ethan Campbell. I'm a te technical director at the Gardner Institute. Um, uh, I just want to welcome you to today's session on uh, graduate studies uh, and recruitment during the pandemic and beyond. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so it's going to be my pleasure in just a moment to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Monica flippin -Wynn, um, to introduce um, our colleagues from across the country today. Before we do that, though, I just want to remind you um, that this is a webinar, so um, your microphones and camera as a participant will be muted uh, by default. But if you'd like to interact with our panel, uh, you can submit questions via the Q&A or the chat feature in uh, the Zoom window here. Um, and if you really want to um, uh, ask a verbal question, um, you can just chat to us and we'd be happy to um, unmute you for a short question. Um, toward the end of today's presentation. Um, as always, uh, today's presentation will be available uh, both in slide form and in a formal um, audiovisual recording after we wrap up today. So if you need to uh, leave early or something like that, we hope you don't have to, but uh, if life calls, it will be uh, available for you afterward. So thanks so much for coming and uh, Dr. Flippin Wen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ethan, I do want to uh, say that Katie Lack, who normally uh, introduces and takes all the questions, uh, is doing some self-care this week, as I hope all of us will try to do soon in the upcoming weeks. And so uh, uh, Ethan will be my uh, partner uh, as far as uh, getting the questions to you. So thank you very much, Ethan, uh, for this morning and all of your help. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good morning to my panelists. We have got such an amazing panel. I know you can tell I can't even breathe today. I'm just so very excited. So let me go ahead and get started. We're talking about uh, graduate uh, studies, graduate admissions, enrollment, whatever we want to talk about in reference to uh, graduate uh, studies for our students. We've got the panel to do it today. We also have a student a former student of mine who uh, is going to be able to talk about uh, uh, his process, his recruitment process, and his acceptance uh, into uh, one of the schools of his choice. So we are excited and thank everyone for being here. We're going to start. I'm just going to introduce everyone. And then after I introduce everyone briefly and say hello, then we'll start right all over. And then you'll be asked to make a two to three minute statement about graduate studies or whatever you'd like to talk about before we get started with the questions. I'm gonna start with Mr. Bryan, Christopher Bryan. He's an Associate Director of Graduate Studies at the University of North Georgia. Hello there, Chris, how are you? I am great, how are you? I'm, I'm good, it's good to see you, good to see you. We're gonna hear a, a lot from you in just a moment. So thank you for taking some time out of your day to be here with us. Certainly. Okay, very good. Next, we have uh, Mark Garrison. Mark Garrison is the uh, Dean of the School of Graduate Studies at uh, Morgan State University. He's also a, an, a professor, excuse me, in psychology. Hello, Dr. Garrison, how are you? Hello, I'm doing very well. I just came from my great, my, my granddaughter's fourth birthday, which we did by Zoom, so. Oh. I it was wonderful, I didn't have right? have a sugar rush because the cake was in Italy. <laughs> okay, well, very good. We'll expect a lot of excitement out of you with the sugar rush virtually uh, for, the, for the remainder of the forum. So thank you very much. Next, we have Persephone uh, Whitfield McDaniels. Dr. McDaniels is a professor of English and she's also a Dean of uh, the Division of Graduate Studies at Jackson State University. Dr. McDaniels, how are you today? Uh, good afternoon. I'm doing great and I'm happy to be here, especially on this panel and really excited to have a student with us too. So thank you for the invitation. You are so welcome. Thank you very much. And last but not least is Daryl, excuse me, Dale R. Robinson. Right now, Daryl is an incoming graduate student. Uh, can I say the university, Daryl? Sure. Okay, uh, for the George Washington University. Uh, he's also digital director uh, with the Mississippi Legislative Black Caucus. Mr. Robinson, how are you? I'm well, thank you for having me. Okay, very good. We hope to get a little bit more out of you. 
<laughs> That's the so uh, we're going to start with uh, uh, Chris. Go ahead and give us a two, a three-minute statement about the status of graduate studies, or what you do, or whatever you like. This panel uh, to to know the our uh, our people in the audience, our our attendees. Yeah, certainly. Well, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be on the panel today, and, and hi everyone. Um, as Dr. Flippenwin said, my name is Chris Bryan. I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions here at the University of North Georgia. Um, just a little bit of background for you, University of North Georgia is a um, comprehensive university. We're part of the University System of Georgia. We have five campuses and I'm on our beautiful Dahlonega campus up in the mountains of North Georgia. Um, I have been in graduate admissions now for um, going, I'm in my second year in graduate admissions. I come to UNG from a private institution where I spent um, nine years as an associate director of undergrad admissions. So made the switch from undergrad to graduate uh, just over two years ago and, and happy to be here. Um, happy to have a live discussion today about you know, recruitment at the graduate level and just, you know, I, I'd love to hear what everyone is doing and, and some thoughts and I'd be happy to share with you, you know, kind of what we're doing here at, at UNG in terms of recruitment for our grad students and things of that nature. So looking forward to today's discussion. Okay, Chris, thanks a lot. And you will get uh, some questions and we'll uh, want to see what your some innovations that you're doing at your university. Uh, Dr. Garrison, talk to us for two to three minutes, please. Yes, yes, thank you. So in, um, in February, Forbes magazine reported uh, that Google had experienced a 12,000% increase in searches for higher education the month before. That bodes very well for uh, all, all of us, uh, except we do know there's a declining population at the undergraduate level. We are actually up this fall 5% in enrollment. And I believe that that's a trend nationally. We're a little bit ahead of the national trend, which is what we always want to be with. If you know our president, David Wilson, we're always wanting to be ahead of the national trend, whatever it may be. And we are very excited to be there. Now, what has happened is that COVID has left us thinking about all different kinds of things. And recruitment is definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. we, we can't do... Um, in-person fairs so that people at least get our name and know what we're about. In fact, we just completed a, a participation in a, an HBCU fair for the rank two institutions, which was very positive. But still, uh, the kinds of communication that we have to use are very much like this. We have to find a way to take advantage of technologies that we have taken for granted for some time because we knew they were there. They were a little more difficult to use. So we thought, uh, this is my uh, seventh meeting today on on Zoom. Uh, it's it's my worst day I think I've had because I have two more to go uh, since <laughs> since we started doing this, and yet each time the ability to be face to face as opposed to in person is very very positive. So we we are trying to find ways to do to take advantage of every bit of that, and uh, and on top of that to learn from what's happened because uh, our we thought we were pretty smooth and discovered when we went to telework that a number of the things that we do can't be done uh, the same way. So we are finding solutions that I think in the end will make us very much more efficient at doing that. But we are getting, we're heading toward a different kind of uh, marketing and recruitment approach as far as admissions goes. Same thing with the, what's going on in education. So in, in the actual processes of education, we, we ran a study that uh, told us that um, three quarters of our students were quite comfortable with remote learning. Uh, that other quarter had various kinds of related issues. Uh, and then, of course, there were complaints about the, this or that bad professor or this or that, and positive comments about this or that great professor, just like there were in the face-to-face -face environments that we'd left. So we see all kinds of change coming for us, and we're trying our best to get ready for it. Okay, thank you very much. We'll hear, hear more about that in a moment. And we're all uh, still trying to adapt to our new uh, alternate normal. So thank you very much, Dr. Garrison. Dr. Uh, McDaniels. Thank you. I don't know if you hear that drilling that's going on behind me. I thought this was just, just the craziest moment for it to start, right? When you said Dr. McDaniels, they started drilling. Um, so I'm thinking that, you know, I, I was thinking about the face of graduate 
studies what it looks like. So the phase of graduate admissions now has changed from seminar rooms and intimate meeting round table settings to online delivery. Um, graduate enrollment though, like Mark mentioned, is actually up across the public universities in the country. Um, all of the public universities in my state as well. Um, this enrollment boost though can be attributed to us looking at GRE and GMAT waivers, um, educational certification test waivers, access to discounted tuition and other various incentives I've seen that have been employed by universities across the country and beyond. And also very sadly to rising unemployment as it relates to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Negatively, um, graduate admissions uh, for international students. Um, I saw one of your earlier forums, um, Dr. Flippin' Wynn, where you had a really engaging conversation about how everything was affecting international students. So we're seeing how it involves increases in deferred enrollment and online enrollment from their home countries instead of the travel abroad to their new university sites that those students were anticipating delays in immigration status applications, and even just plain old admission denials. The face of graduate recruitment, which Mark mentioned too, is, is totally now what on a computer, a tablet, or a telephone screen, as best recruitment practices now involve virtual tips and netiquette or online etiquette, online platform choices, break rooms for department recruiting. So we have to get, we're really having to get used to all of this. And, um, and of course, social media is now an electronic billboard for promotional delivery to um, try to recruit for our programs. And then also we have to look at the fact that students, faculty and staff are Zoom, go to meeting and Google Hangout exhausted. <laughs> and add the climate of the country with um, social justice and election protests and rising COVID numbers, you have the really urgent need for self-care and counseling. So that's what the face of graduate admissions is looking like right now. Okay, well, thank yeah. you very much for sharing and we'll uh, get some, uh, hopefully we'll get some responses on that and some questions for you. So thank you very much for being here. Mr. Robinson, talk to us about uh, applying for graduate school or what you're doing or whatever you'd like us to know. Yes, ma'am. So first of all, let me say, uh, Dr. Flippin Wynn, my former uh, undergraduate professor is the only person who could probably get me on to do this, but I'm happy to be here and thanks again for having me. Um, so again, my name is uh, Daryl Robinson. Um, as she stated, I'm a self-employed digital strategist and incoming master's student at the George Washington University uh, this spring. Upon graduation from uh, my undergraduate institution at Jackson State, uh, I had a goal to pursue graduate studies and uh, eventually become a uh, educator professor in my field. Uh, I delayed that decision opting to uh, pursue employment and over time uh, my desire to pursue graduate work just kind of faded due to demands of uh, my work uh, and my experience with success as a small business owner. Then COVID happened and I found myself with a uh, renewed passion for so many things uh, related to uh, what it is that I do and uh, you know, just passionate I lost along the way, including uh, my desire to be in academia. And I uh, came across a quote earlier in the pandemic uh, from an, an author. Uh, he's now deceased, but if I could summarize it, he said that crises have a way of bringing us back to our passions. Um, and I think that that's been uh, the blessing in COVID for me. And so um, I decided uh, to apply to graduate school, uh, thinking that, you know, in a pandemic, I would have to move at some point. Uh, I was definitely looking at institutions outside of Mississippi. Uh, my top institution was actually the George Washington University due to uh, a program that they had uh, that I know um, individuals who have gone through that program and have spoke very highly of it. Uh, and I felt that it met my needs. And so uh, I applied and I was accepted. Um, and to my surprise, uh, in a pandemic, the process was actually pretty seamless. Um, and it was, uh, but it was different from, you know, recruitment processes that I've experienced before. I had applied to graduate school before, though I had uh, deferred. And I found myself asking questions that I never thought that uh, I would ask. I never, you know, thought that I would be uh, in a pandemic, uh, nonetheless going to school in a pandemic. I also found myself considering scenarios that I hadn't considered before. But I'm looking forward to uh, starting this journey and what they're calling, I guess, the second wave. 
uh, I'll be beginning uh, at the top of the new year. Uh, fortunately, uh, that will be online. And so uh, that will be a new experience for me and quite the experience, I'm sure. Uh, but pending better conditions, I'm looking forward to relocating to Washington, D.C. Uh, next fall to finish out that program. And so I'm crossing my fingers on that. Just looking forward to engaging this conversation, talking uh, my, about my experience with applying to graduate school and uh, the things that I've dealt with and um, answering any questions anybody may have. So thanks again for having me. You are welcome, uh, Mr. Robinson. Same, uh, same uh, concise student that I graduated. I'm so glad that you're here. So Ethan, do we have any questions? It's now, if you have not put your questions in the chat box, you please go ahead and do that. Or if you would like to ask one of our uh, panelists a question directly, you can raise your hand and we will call on you. So do we have any questions, Ethan? Uh, let me see here. <laughs> no, I've, while you're looking for a question, one of the things Dr. Garrison, you talked about, and I think Dr. Uh, McDaniels, um, you just came from a meeting and you have two others and we're all Zoomed and any kind of go to meeting or, so we're all Zoomed out. So even if we have a room full of uh, attendees as we do today, sometimes people just wanna sit and listen. Right. They don't want to, uh, you know, they, it's not that they don't want to uh, participate, it's that uh, they've come because they know that we're going to have an excellent panel. They're going to let you do all the talking. And sometimes the questions are kind of slow. Uh, so we do have a question, I think, uh, for, uh, for the panelists, don't we, uh, Ethan, a couple in the chat two, box? Two for, for, two for Daryl, it looks like. Okay, uh, let's see. What are some of the unique questions Mr. Robinson found himself asking during the recruitment process? Uh, yeah, so um, I think the, I mean, the, the biggest question was how were they handling COVID? Um, not just uh, from the recruitment process, but then also, you know, what was, what was class, what was coursework going to look like? Uh, one thing I can say about George Washington, um, and I wonder if they had some of these systems in place before COVID happened, because it seemed very seamless. Uh, they had, um, you know, virtual, I, I guess, you know, college tours or, or information sessions where, you know, I could either join a Zoom session or call in to get information. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I was really impressed with was that uh, the faculty members in the department were surprisingly very responsive uh, to emails, uh, which, you know, I've experienced in the past had, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, you may not get a response uh, because if you're emailing the wrong person, you know, they just may not respond. And so, um, I, I was really impressed about that. Uh, but then uh, in a deeper sense, um, you know, COVID, I think just in our society has brought attention to a lot of other issues we've left unaddressed. And so one of the big things for me uh, that I looked at this time that I didn't necessarily pay attention to um, previously was, you know, diversity and inclusion. Uh, if, if I'm an online student or if I actually relocate to DC, who's there to kind of help guide me through this program that I feel like I can lean on and rely on. Um, and so I actually went through the department's website and looked at the professors, you know, how many African-American uh, professors were on the staff. And I mean, that's the diversity part, but then what were their stories? One thing I liked about the department is that uh, everybody had a biography and it wasn't just academic accomplishments. Uh, it was, you know, where they're from, uh, what type of work they've done. And I was actually very surprised to see that uh, there's a gentleman on the faculty there from Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is three hours north of me. So I can relate to things like that. Uh, those were two big things. Um, and so, you know, I just felt like I needed something uh, or, or conversation or, or examples beyond COVID uh, to, to help me kind of move into this space to, to feel like I could belong there and I can navigate, uh, you know, beyond the challenges that COVID may bring. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it looks like we have another one here. Um, What's the difference between, or what have our panelists perhaps uh, observed as the differences between uh, master's level recruitment and PhD recruitment? Just uh, looking for some granularity there beyond, beyond the uh, overall scope of the graduate experience. Okay, uh, Dr. McDaniels, you can give us a brief answer and then all of our uh, panelists who are uh, working with graduate students, please chime in. I noticed you said brief. Okay. <laughs> Uh, um, so the difference between recruiting masters and um, PhD level students, that was the question, correct? 
Um, I would I would say that as far as our, our platforms and, and going into virtual recruitment, there hasn't been much of a big difference. However, um, the ways that we do recruit those students are different. For one thing, when we're including, uh, recruiting um, students for PhDs, in most cases, they are actually coming from our master's programs already or from master's programs at sister universities or even um, they have been, they were once upon a time, our undergraduate students who are sometimes coming back to the university. So that pool has been easier for us. For the master's students, we're reaching out to undergraduates across the, across the country, I should say across the world. Um, so we are trying to reach out to directly to other universities. Um, sometimes those universities reach out to us. Uh, we've had a, a, a real, um, a partnership, I guess, with, with some universities across the years, but those have been face to face. So if they haven't actually um, uh, transformed over or, or started employing anything virtual, then we're now reaching out to them. So we found that, that we have to do the reaching out. And you heard Mark mention earlier that um, through a coalition of uh, research, um, level research too, HBCUs, we actually came together, um, the, the 10 plus um, universities in a recruitment effort together. And I wouldn't, and we kind of took our time on saying the word recruitment. We actually um, used an expo. You know, we wanted to just let people know what the offerings were across our universities. So here we were with, with people that we usually consider competitors um, joining arms and making sure that everybody uh, was supporting each other and getting the word out about the offerings that we had at our university. So we're, we're pulling together to, to make this all work. Okay. okay. Uh, Chris, wh wh what do you think? Yeah, so um, actually UNG is unique in that we actually just launched our first PhD program. Um, so we have over 30 programs in the graduate school, if you will, um, but we just actually launched our first PhD. Um, we have um, five other doctoral level programs, um, EDD, um, DMP, and things of that nature. Um, but from what I have experienced uh, through COVID, the recruitment for both um, the, the doctoral level degrees and the master level degrees, as well as the certification um, programs that we offer here at the university, it's all been relatively flat. Um, I've not really seen a, a spike in, in a care for students gaining a master's degree versus the ones looking to, you know, maybe go into our higher ed doc program, right? Um, it, it's, it's really just been, it's, it's been flat. Okay, and Dr. Garrison? Yes, um, I, I think it's a really interesting question about, uh, the difference between the master's and the doctorate. And, and I wouldn't segregate out the PhDs from the uh, education uh, degrees in this particular way, because um, the, the student journey from uh, first deciding to do a degree to being there, uh, Daryl uh, illustrated that quite a bit. He had had a thought, he was going to do something, he got from that thought got sidetracked into something that was good for him. And now he's back to his original passion and, or at least the, the one that's now guiding him passion. And that's, I think that's what we see in a doctoral student very often. Uh, we do have not that many uh, full-time on campus type of, you know, uh, students who've just come out of uh, college at, at the doctoral level, I'd say maybe a third. In fact, our average age of graduate student is about 31. So we have quite a bit of, in, quite a number of individuals who are returning for one reason or another. Now, the master students, though, are very, very focused because their degree is going to take them to a particular job of, of, of approach or, or a, a goal that they have. The doctoral students have themselves a different kind of goal because they know what they generally want to do, but they know that they have to get through this process of, of completion, which is going to be itself kind of a full-time job. So this, this differentiates, I think, the source that they come from. So the source that we have in the master's student is much more general population source. And the doctoral student, it's more likely connected to various kinds of contacts, awareness of the programming. Uh, we have um, 
16 active doctoral programs and one that's that's just being approved uh, by the, the Maryland Higher Education Commission. Our goal is uh, to achieve the kind of numbers we think would be a stable environment, would be more like uh, 20 to 25 doctoral programs. And that is that is actually the other side of this, which is that we have an administration that is endorsing this particular approach. Um, that is that we see a value in research, we see our role in research, and we're, we're headed that way. So that's the, that message is what goes out to the doctoral ap applicants as opposed to the master's level. It's, it's more a profession. Well, these are not professional degrees necessarily, but it is, this will enhance your, um, your status professionally and it'll give you some skills to do that. The doctoral is, this is going to make you a contributor to research. And, and so those two different points of view, I think are what help guide us toward uh, how we might recruit. And what we see in the actual behavior of that is that then we we've done open houses for doctoral programs that are just for the doctoral program. And we've done the expo kind of thing in the fair for all programs. So individual programs have set off and done some of their own recruiting directly, but that's usually built on already inflowing students who have made some uh, expression of interest. So there are different tactics with each one and a certain number of programs will require a certain kind of approach. Um, but I think that's that's the difference that there are, uh, what the end goal is, is also driving how you approach the student at the beginning. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ethan, we have a couple of hands raised. There's a question, uh, do you, uh, Dontrell Parson, would you like to uh, ask your question live? Uh, the hand I'm seeing raised, Dr. Flippin' Wynn, is Valerie Goss. So let's go to her okay. for them and see if they would like to speak. Very good. Thanks, Ethan. Valerie, we've unmuted you if you'd like to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm at Chicago State University and actually sitting in my research laboratory right now. Um, I have mostly undergrad students and uh, it's a rare opportunity today, but I have one question for the recruiters, and that is, um, are you finding any decrease um, in funding opportunities for incoming graduate students? Are you finding any, um, any challenges with um, recruiting students and being able to let them know that there will be funding opportunities available for them? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gass. It's good to it's good to hear you. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. uh, Thank <laughs> you. you say, yeah. Yeah, but since we've got we're loading up on questions, we're going to ask uh, one of our panelists to answer and then move on to other questions, Ethan, so we can get them all in. Uh, Chris, why don't you take this one for us? Would you? Certainly, yeah. Um, we have not seen a decrease in, in funding and, and scholarship opportunities um, for graduate students um, due to the pandemic. Um, I will be honest, we, we, um, we don't necessarily have a big robust um, pot of money to begin with, mm -hmm. right, as probably most everyone else on the call is in the same boat. But um, that's one thing that, um, that we have not seen a decrease in, and, and we're very fortunate by that. Great. Great to hear. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Goss. Take care. Yes, yes. I'm still going to be hanging in here. Interested to hear what the panelists and grad students are saying. Thank you for the opportunity. You are welcome. Uh, Ethan, well, what do you have? Is there another question? Uh, anyone sure. Else? So let's alternate here. We'll go back to a, a typed question. Uh, so Shante asks, uh, we've done a lot of recruiting via name buys from the GRE. Uh, can the panel please provide some types of recruitment they're doing um, during the uh, pandemic. Okay, uh, Dr. Garrison. So we have actually engaged a marketing firm to help us do exactly what needs to be done. Now there's a small portion of the, um, so and we, we expect to approach about 70,000 people this year. And, and a small portion of that is name buys uh, from GRE and GMAT. But, the larger portion is from uh, matching up the, 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 the national available databases with a persona of our student. And with that persona, then uh, sort of 
marrying it down to what it is we're looking for in, in both uh, types of student, age zone, living area, and with a very sophisticated uh, approach. And by the way, it does cost quite a bit of money. So, so the university has actually stepped up and said, we've got to do this because these other ways aren't working. And name, just direct name buys uh, are, you kind of have to do that, but you, it's not sufficient to carry the, the load. Uh, I think that's just a very, uh, I mean, it's, it's very good that you observe that because you have to have, everybody's buying the name. So you have to have a way to approach them that is uh, sophisticated and, and controlled. Okay. I, I think it's also interesting. One of the, you know how they have all the conferences and they have exhibits. That's one of the ways that we always got an opportunity to do some uh, informal recruiting and we're not in person anymore. So we're missing out on some really interesting uh, opportunities to recruit and, and to get at our graduate students. Thank you very much. Ethan, you've got an, another question. I see there are quite a few. There's a couple for uh, Mr. Robinson also. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and unmute uh, Don Shrell and allow a verbal question here. So, Don Shrell, you are now unmuted. Uh, and sometimes people raise their hands by accident. Oh, there she goes. Hi. Sure. Hello. Can you hear me okay? I'm good. That's your person. How are you today? I, I am good. I am good, Dr. Flippin. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This question is for Mr. Robinson. Uh, Mr. Robinson, I definitely appreciate you uh, being here. Uh, you were nudged and accepted uh, the opportunity. So I definitely appreciate that. My question to you is this, uh, in regard to the graduate recruitment and enrollment process, what are things that you appreciated about the level of communication that you received from the academic institution you were accepted to? So in regard to how they communicated with you, uh, what did you value or appreciate most, most about that? Or what did you find to be helpful or successful? Yeah, a great question. Thanks for that. Um, I think one of the, the first things, uh, you know, I got emails. Uh, and I got emails from a lot of schools, but, um, you know, they sent emails. And I think uh, George Washington had a lot of substance in their emails. Uh, for instance, COVID emails, they were very honest about uh, COVID from the jump. Once they realized I was interested and I started getting emails, they started to let us know like, hey, uh, you know, we're still figuring out what we're going to do. And then when they decided what they were going to do, I got an email about that as well. Uh, I also appreciated uh, in an email sense, um, actual, you know, testimonials about um, students that had gone through their program and what was going on. So it wasn't just a general like, hey, application deadline is such and such apply here. Uh, there were things that I could actually look at to make a determination, um, you know, for myself based off of others' experience. And some of those people in those emails looked like me. Um, I really liked, um, I attended uh, one of the open houses and I liked it because uh, when I applied to graduate school and was accepted in the past, uh, my top schools, I actually went to campus to meet the professors because I'm interested to know what the culture is like. And had there been no COVID this time around, I would have gone to DC uh, and other places to determine, you know, what the culture is like there, but uh, couldn't do that. So the next best thing that we're all zoomed out, you know, is a virtual open house. And I like the ability to be able to communicate. It's not just an information session where somebody's coming on telling me this is our, you know, this is our program, this is what we offer. I could actually ask questions and engage. And I think the biggest thing uh, that I've been fond of, um, actually since being accepted and before accepting the offer, they send you a link to a Facebook group that they have for students in the department. Current students, new accepted students. Um, and there's actually a nice little community in that Facebook group, which tells me a lot about what it's like in the department on campus. Because people don't engage in Facebook groups if you know they're not already engaging on campus, I believe. And maybe COVID, uh, has pushed people to do it a little bit more, but um, I'm, I'm hearing from uh, current students, I'm hearing from, you know, my new classmates in the spring, um, at least three times a week about different topics, whether it's coursework, what classes are you taking, professors, housing, um, and so it's, it's beginning to feel like a community, though I'm a thousand miles away from D.C., so I can really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Parson, for, ask, uh, for uh, asking, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Robinson. Uh, Ethan, what you got for us? Sure. So uh, this one is for Dr. Garrison. Does he mind sharing uh, how much of his marketing budget uh, 
was or is. You mute it. It's actually the provost budget, <laughs> budget because I've never had a marketing budget that belonged to me. But this is, we're talking uh, between three and $400,000 a year. Wow. Okay. And, uh, and, you know, that's, and that's, I think, on the cheap, when you look at the other things that can be done, another portion was offered to add to that uh, direct Google buy, direct ad Google buys, uh, direct Google buys, right? how it's called. And that was in, in the neighborhood of another $400,000. And we chose not to do that part. Okay. And so uh, uh, those institutions that are not uh, uh, doing marketing budgets or uh, they rely on their independent departments and the savvy of their uh, own universities uh, to try to get the message and the word out to recruitment. So uh, this is an interesting place we find ourselves in. Let me yeah. say something about that. That's actually like herding cats. I mean, it is. Uh, we have one group that just goes crazy and communicates all day long with everybody. And another group, it's like, you know, I'm busy this month and I can't do that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a real challenge. So by not forcing everyone to be part of it or expecting that's the only th source, I think this actually uh, is, is valuable because the, the, the analysis is I only need to get 28 students to pay for that. Okay. That, that's how much growth we have to have to cover that cost. And finally, we have administration that understands return on investment and that investment's necessary to have any kind of positive effect. Um, and there are all other kinds of dim dimensions related to what we're doing that are part of this, but that's that was the, the selling point to the administration. Okay. Um, Dr. McDaniels, what uh, your thought on marketing plans? I know you did some uh, some meetings with your uh, graduate faculty and, and departments to get out there and everything. So what what are you doing specifically? Uh, if I was, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at the question there. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that in the Q&A. I'm acting like Mark now. I'm navigating uh, the Q&A um, about the advice you could give a small 100% online university that does not have the very large marketing budget we were just talking about. Um, but I'm sure Mark had to work hard to get people to understand, like you said, the return on investment. So one thing that we did um, that I thought was really, really, really beneficial is that we brought in a communications expert. Um, we just kind of looked at the fact that, okay, the face of graduate recruitment is changing, so we have to change with it. Um, our departments at first may not have um, felt like they were as ready for the change. Um, and that's just some of them because a lot of them have professional recruiters that are out there and in the field all the time. But some of us have to rely on our, um, you know, our graduate faculty to step in and, and to become recruiters. And so one is a few things that we learned from the communications expert that we brought in. One of course was that we could not be resistant to social media. We had to use it to the best of our ability, um, and we had to have um, a marketing plan. We had to have a plan for how we were going to advertise on social media, and it needed to be something that was worked out. It needed to be consistent. Um, it also, we, we were also um, taught about podcast series, um, which a couple of our groups have immediately um, gotten into the hang of that. They're doing weekly series. One is every Monday, one is every Friday. And um, the communication expert, she talked to us uh, really in depth about ideas and things that we did not want to miss, that you don't want to miss the group of uh, groups of international students and their concerns. You don't want to miss um, the different levels of graduate recruitment that you're involved in, the master's level student. At our university in education, we have the specialist and also then, of course, the doctoral student. Um, she also talked to us about making sure that we did not miss the opportunity to use our graduate students as our main recruiters, that we should make sure that we had video testimonials from our, our you know, success stories and our students. And also, um, someone mentioned um, in one of the, the, in the chat as well, you know, how do we replace these recruitment techniques? techniques where we used to bring in students and walk them around campus. So now you are charged with developing the virtual tour. 
um, maybe that tour is still someone walking around campus and showing you certain spots. But there are so many other um, platforms out there where, that are really impressive um, because we, we need to, you know, we're, we are competing against each other when we're, you know, recruiting students. So we have to make sure that our recruitment, though it moves online and becomes virtual, that it's still professional, that it's still engaging, um, and that we are making sure we bring the experts in and we're not just creating things off the top of our head or fly by night. Um, so we, we have to make sure of that. And I can go ahead and just tell you right now that the communication specialist that I brought in, she was doing me a favor. You know, she came in, she's a colleague. So um, Dr. Flip and Wynn, we thank you for being our communications expert. Um, she also extended herself out to our departments as well for follow-up, um, for any kind of um, individual meetings that they might want to have. So I'm saying to you, even though we started that out um, with, with, my knowing her, I say reach out to a consultant who can come in and help your departments move into the new era, especially because a lot of people say, well, post COVID, what are you going to do? Does everything go back? No, of course not. You now expose people to the fact that there are different avenues that we can take in recruitment. So now we will be employing all of these new techniques along with our old. We need a serious, perfect mix of both moving forward. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McDaniels. And thank you for, uh, I'm, I'm hoping everybody got uh, what they needed from some of those sessions. Um, Ethan, do we have any questions? We've got some concerns uh, about just general graduate uh, studies uh, and how our universities are doing with retention and enrollment. Retention is a, a big, a uh, big item right now we're talking about. So uh, if I could, I'd like to ask just really quickly, uh, how's the retention component of your graduate students since we you know, started with, uh, we had COVID in March and now you've brought your students back. How's retention uh, looking, Dr. Garrison? You're muted? No, no. I, I... I hit a button and something else came up. So um, we've been tracking this for, I'd say, well, I, I went back from before when I got here, uh, got to Morgan. So about 12 or I said 14 years of, uh, of data now that I've been uh, looking at with retention. And we don't use the term retention, it, uh, in, at least among our talk, we talk about persistence. Right, okay. Persistence to me uh, is what percentage of, of enrollment returns of those who could or were eligible to return. And we just go back to two terms. So we have uh, fall and spring. Uh, we take that number and remove all the new students out of our new en enrollment. And that number gives us a persistence rate. Our persistent rate is actually at 92% this year. And historically it runs between 90 and 91. So it's actually up. And that it's like, it's a, it's a sort of a stunning kind of, you know, after all of that crisis through the spring that we experienced to have them students still coming back. And I think that it, the, the term persistence says a lot about graduate students. And sometimes they have to take a semester off, you know, sometimes even a little longer than that. And yet we don't hold that against anybody in any way. We encourage people to come back and we are looking for ways actually to find people who've stopped out maybe years ago that we want to help them finish out their degree because those numbers aren't counted by mid MHAC and so forth, uh, Maryland higher education toward any kind of a measure that we have. It, the real number is the degrees we will the output, the people who come out with a better life uh, ahead of them because of the degree they earned. So persistence is our rate and it is actually up a uh, tiny bit, but it's up. That's terrific. Uh, Chris? How's it yeah, looking? so uh, here at uh, UNG, um, back whenever uh, the pandemic hit and, and everything, our enrollment management team implemented a um, what we call uh, our withdrawal pilot 1.0 program. Um, and it was where we assembled a group of uh, campus leaders, you know, faculty and staff to come together and, and utilize some software we have on campus to have it essentially where every student who is making a withdrawal request from the university 
that a staff member, a professional member from the university will reach out to them via phone, email, whatever the student indicated on their form as their preferred contact to reach out to them and you know, follow up with them in, in regards to their case and, and things of that nature. And um, fast forward to now, I volunteered over the summer to take on the graduate load um, because we have a very small population of graduate students here at the university. We have roughly about 800 um, graduate students altogether. Um, and so with that smaller load, it was obviously a very manageable case for me to, for me to take on this fall. And um, it's been very, very positive. So the cases that I have that have come in, I have you know, reached out to the student to find out more about their situation if they're willing to share that information and be more of a resource to them saying, hey, okay, I get it. You're, you're gonna have to go, but just know I'm here for you whenever you do come back. Um, and, and providing them with my contact information um, so that they can reach out and, and oftentimes providing them with options saying, you know, because of the pandemic, I'm going to have to take off a semester. What do I need to do to re-enroll next semester, right? So having those resources there for them and um, it has worked very, very well and um, kudos to our enrollment management team who put that together and, and kind of spearheaded that. Um, it, it has worked very, very well for us. Okay. The individual narratives and the stories really make a difference when we're talking about uh, persistence and retention, especially at the doctoral level uh, and also the masters. Uh, Dr. Uh, McDaniels, you want to chime in for a minute? Um, yeah, since we're talking about persistence, I thought about um, the fact that when we're measuring our persistence, it's also about how well we're taking care of our students. So right now, um, I, I mentioned self-care a little bit earlier, but now I'm talking about how well we're taking care of them at the university, um, making sure that our, that our COVID plan is updated um, and relevant at all times, making sure that we don't forget about our students' um, mental health, um, self, uh, and also that we are surveying our students and reaching out to them about their needs. Um, one thing that um, uh, academic affairs, the Office of Academic Affairs has done at our university, our provost is making sure that um, departments, colleges, and the university as a whole um, keeps a series of um, town hall meetings going for our students so that they can just chime in, say what they need to say, type in what they need to type in about their needs. Um, I, I think that we also need to look at a lot of national surveys. Um, the National Science Foundation um, has had a national survey to go around that has um, basically um, honed in on what the needs of students are, uh, what we might be missing. Um, for example, for the students who are in the hard sciences, if your thesis depends on the fact that you have to have lab time, you know, how is somebody meeting that need? Um, what, what's being done for you? Um, and in addition, we have to think about the fact that students also have um, housing insecurities, um, food insecurities at this time. We can't miss all of those things and we have to make sure that we're addressing them along the way and taking care of our students. And the other big thing um, that I think that we cannot miss is that students persist uh, their persistence also depends on their professor um, to student interactions that they usually get in their classrooms that leads to outside of the classroom interaction as well. So how do we make sure that we can mirror that type of interaction in our virtual classes right now? Um, like I said, the graduate, stu graduate students, especially on um, the doctoral level, are used to sitting around um, a seminar table. Um, it's, it's close knit. So how do we, um, you know, we have to make sure that we're finding ways to, to make sure that students have what they need educationally, uh, emotionally, and physically, um, as well. We have to make sure of that. Thank you very much. I mean, you mentioned the town halls and I think Mr. Robinson mentioned uh, the Facebook uh, page or the group. And so we're trying to find ways which we can build those social connected uh, uh, places and uh, a sense of belonging, uh, but also uh, 
you know, we're always talking about faculty development for our undergraduate professors, but also there should be maybe some faculty development for our doctoral faculty in trying to establish uh, those types of uh, lanes to be in. So thank you very much for that. Ethan, do we have a couple questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, this question seems to be picking up on what Daryl was mentioning earlier um, in terms of really finding ways to connect with a virtual um, recruitees, right? Um, you know, things like making sure your recruitment pool and your recruiters look like the American population and things like that. So perhaps Daryl could say more about that or other panelists. Daryl? Sure. Um, is, is a specific question somewhere to make sure I, I answer it properly? Uh, so, the, so the question really centered uh, specifically on um, connecting with um, uh, prospect, prospective recruit, uh, recruitees on an <clears throat> individual and like meaningful level. Like how do you make that meaningful, right? And not just here's this PowerPoint kind of thing, right? Yeah, so I may mention earlier, uh, one of the things that was really impressive to me was, you know, during virtual open houses, uh, you know, we could actually engage uh, individuals that were giving us information. Uh, much like, uh, I guess, this platform here where, you know, you set up a webinar and you allow people, you know, to raise their hands and ask questions uh, because, uh, you know, the presentation might not necessarily cover everybody's concern and, and we're all adjusting to uh, the new normal. So there are new concerns. I think one additional thing uh, that's been really impressive to me, and I actually just put a comment uh, in the um, chat. Um, I get just as many emails from student organizations uh, as I do, you know, from the general uh, university. Uh, about what's going on in student life. And so they found a way to empower student organizations to kind of continue student life uh, from a virtual perspective because the campus is virtually closed. And so, uh, for instance, uh, in addition to, you know, the Facebook group where you can develop community, I can also connect with, um, you know, other students outside the uh, College of Arts and Sciences uh, to discuss, you know, what's on their uh, advocacy agenda coming up or express concerns to students that I may and I may feel more comfortable doing that versus uh, going directly to a uh, professor or an administrator. And so uh, it's just really impressive to me that, um, you know, I'm able to engage with professors and administrators, but I'm also able to engage uh, with the graduate student body as well. Um, you know, almost at, at, you know, it says just at my fingertips, it's not really hard to do at all, so. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Robinson, uh, uh, making uh, those inroads to belonging uh, is instrumental when you're bringing in prospective students. And it seems based on what Mr. Uh, Robinson is suggesting is that they've uh, begun to do that and, and done it well for him. Ethan? Great, so um, looping, looping back around here um, to something that Dr. Bryan said um, uh, in reference to uh, you know, providing students or trying to get students resources um, as they're thinking about potentially withdrawing. Um, have you found that that has ever been immediately effective in terms of um, changing the student's mind about leaving or perhaps it's more of a wraparound effect where they, you see them coming back more frequently um, using these methods? Yeah, so most definitely I can, um, at the graduate level, um, short answer to that is, um, they really have not been taking up um, the offer on the additional resources available, right? Because mainly for the graduate students and the cases that I have worked with, um, they are having to leave the university for reasons that they just simply cannot control. Financial reasons, you know, their spouse or family member or something like that um, has lost their job. So they're having to pick up another job. Um, and, and simply just don't have time for, for graduate school. Um, some of my colleagues who have been working the undergrad cases, the resources have helped them, right? Having the, the, um, the, the emotional um, resources that are out there available on campus for the student's disposal, um, the financial resources, all, all, the, all the different implications there um, with, with the resources um, that are available, that has definitely helped with the undergrad population. But specifically for the graduate students that I have worked with, the resources have not worked. They have been very appreciative of the resources, but unfortunately it was just out of their, their uh, control. Um, and I will say this, um, talk, looping back around to what Dr. McDaniels had mentioned, the town halls, that's something that um, our president and uh, her cabinet 
Uh, they have done that. Um, they have been participating in uh, virtual town halls um, throughout the whole summer for the students and for faculty and staff. And they have been very, very well attended and well received. It's a great outlet for the students to see the president and her cabinet. Um, they're all via Zoom in their respective offices and places on campus and allow them to ask them questions and kind of open up a more vulnerable side, right? Um, and so that's, that's been very, um, very good for us. Okay. Um, what I do want to do, I, and I, I apologize, it looks like I, we have so many questions and, but it's also recruitment and enrollment and just general uh, graduate studies. So I apologize. I, I probably shouldn't have put them together. There's so much out there that people want to uh, talk about. So I apologize and I will uh, arrange another opportunity for us to, uh, to talk about specifically our graduate students and our graduate uh, studies. Uh, we have only so much time and I want to be respectful of that. So I would like each of my uh, panelists uh, to take about a minute and sum up uh, our, our talks today, whether you're going to talk about your experiences, what you want people to think about uh, as they are thinking about graduate studies, enrollment, or uh, uh, graduate recruitment. And I'm going to ask each of my panelists to give us about a minute uh, to uh, wind things up. So I'm going to start uh, with Daryl, Mr. Robinson. Of course, I get to go first. Certainly been a pleasure to be here today, and, and uh, this has been a really good conversation. And I am, uh, I hope that I said something that uh, has helped uh, someone kind of navigate, uh, you know, how they how they do their work or how they engage uh, incoming students uh, in COVID nineteen. Uh, I may be a special uh, kind. I really value relationship. I value engagement. Uh, Dr. Flippin Wynn will, will tell you I've spent uh, numerous times uh, moments in her office. And so uh, not being able to do that, not being able to go um, you know, to campus to have conversations with professors, to have conversations with administrators, um, you know, really isn't uh, the ideal situation for me, but I can appreciate an institution who uh, seems to have taken uh, time to have a conversation around how uh, we can put uh, programs and processes in place uh, to uh, really engage our students and make them feel like they're here, even though they can't be. Uh, and so uh, that, uh, in addition to other things I, I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, really helped me decide on uh, George Washington as an institution for me. Um, and before I close, uh, if any of you uh, have any questions for me uh, uh, beyond this, I've, I've answered some in the comments, uh, feel free to reach out. I will uh, post my information in the chat. Um, and, you know, more than happy to help any way I can. So thank you again for having me and uh, thank you all for this great panel. Thanks, Mr. Robinson. I appreciate it. I hope to be updated on uh, what's going on with you uh, with appropriate email etiquette. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Dr. McDaniels, sum it up for us. So um, I was thinking about the fact that uh, we we've been talking about how we've had to adjust because of all of the negative things that have happened. Um, and so it made me think about the fact that, you know, in negative times, you have to think about, well, what's the collateral, collateral beauty that comes out of it all? So one thing that has happened with us, and I just wanted to mention this because I hadn't before, is that our Graduate Student Association has become fiercely strong um, because students need to reach out to them for information. Um, they, they have become a first line of information for our graduate students, um, making sure that they communicate um, health information, um, food security information to them, financial literacy, financial aid, insurance know-how, um, just making sure that they know how to get health insurance, car insurance, things like that that we hadn't thought about before. Um, they've put out job announcements as they come to them. Um, they've put out announcements for funding uh, to continue with their graduate education and so forth. So we have had this wonderful thing that has come out of such a hard time. And I've, I've been very proud of that um, and because we are, you know, we house our graduate student association in our graduate school. Um, their office space is here and everything. So I know that we're leading this, you're gonna lead us into another conversation. I heard that already. So um, I just wanted to mention that because we're talking about how do we, you know, the other things about graduate students, how do we support them? 
So a, a good, strong graduate student association, we need to make sure that they're firmly um, implanted at our universities so that they're there for our students. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. McDaniels, and for uh, saying in advance that you're looking for the next conversation. Mr. Brian, Chris, tell us, sum it up for us. Thank you so much, and I, I appreciate the, the privilege of, of being on the panel um, with everyone here. Um, I, I guess the best way to sum it up is we're all in this together. We're all in this fight together, and we're going to get through it, right? Um, it may not be, it's not going to be today, and it's not going to be tomorrow, but we're going to get through it. Um, and I think uh, us joining forces and, 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 and holding hands together and, and proceeding forward is, is the best way to to approach COVID and, and recruiting and, and, and everything um, moving forward. So if, if I can never be of any of help to anyone, feel free to, to reach out. I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. And thank you again also for just saying that uh, you're available next time. So very good. Uh, Dr. Garrison, sum it up for all of us, please. Well, I will. I have an, an idea about how to do that. So. Okay. So, but thank you for inviting me in the first place. And I'm, I've really enjoyed doing this. And I've, I think this has been a very good panel. What we're hearing is the old saw, don't waste a good crisis. It, it's the good side of this crisis is it has forced us to pay more attention to communication because that's the only tool we have. We can't walk up to somebody and start a conversation. We have to start the conversation, you know, in one way or another and do it in a way that the person's going to listen and pay attention and be, be energized by what we say. So I see that we have been increasing our community. Now, as an HBCU, we have that already. It's already there. But how can you do it remotely? Well, there, people are finding out how. They're, they're discovering a means to do what makes us such a great place to do. And this is my almost my, this is my 38th year at an HBCU. So, I mean, I've seen this Though, as you might notice, I'm, I'm not a black person. I've seen this going on and it affects everybody. White, black, um, Asian, uh, Latin American. I mean, we have ev everybody's engaged in it. And it's not, it's, it, it's a thing that grows well beyond any racial boundaries. It is just a great place to have these kind of things happen. And we are challenged to make it happen in a completely I mean, it can't be any more challenge. It's a challenge of a lifetime kind of situation. It's been over 100 years since we had something like this where we had to do this. And on top of that, then we've had the, the social justice happen. The, all of those issues have been raised. And with it, an economic crisis. So we get like three things at once that, you know, even one of them is, is a disaster. And we are thriving in it. We just need to make it so that others can thrive too. And I think that's where, what we're talking about here now. So that's how I see it. Well, I want to thank everyone. And you always know when you have an, uh, an amazing panel because no one leaves. <laughs> so even though it's after the time that I've taken up so much of it, uh, our attendees still remain uh, wanting to hear what you have to say. So I want to thank you very much for being here. We'll, we'll do this again under a, a different type topic talking about graduate students. But I think we have something very positive to look forward to. We've got amazing leaders at our schools and uh, Chris and uh, Persephone and uh, Mark. And then we have uh, the future. Uh, we've got Mr. Robinson uh, out there uh, taking the stand. So I think as uh, we talked previous, as we mentioned, out of uh, something so horrific, maybe we might have some, uh, there might be some positives that we can move forward to. So I wanna thank Ethan for helping out today. I really appreciate it. Thank all the attendees. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, our next uh, forum is on December 2nd, where we are going to talk with uh, our students who we had originally back in August to see how they've gotten through uh, their semester. So please join us for that. If you have any other questions or comments, you know how to reach us. We're so glad that you've been here. Take care, be safe, everybody. And happy Thanksgiving in advance and be yeah. safe. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> see you later. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.